Welcome back to Watch the Bookerman and the fourth episode of Paul Heyman's TNA 2010. We're just coming off the back of Genesis, the first pay-per-view of the new era. And just before I get into anything else, I have actually started the save again. The reason for that is that the mod that I was using, Stiches 2010, it was set up to only have America and Europe active at the beginning because it was a beta version. Since then, there's been quick progress made, quicker than I expected, so now there's a database available, a full release with Mexico and Japan, so New Japan, AAA, CMLL are all playable in the game, and I just think that'll make for a bigger, better game world, and especially long term, which I want this save to be, we're going to have better interactions with other promotions, for instance, Kenny Omega, Prince Devitt, rising up the ranks of New Japan, if that happens to happen, it might not, but the idea then that using our working agreement we can bring them over, maybe we can start a working agreement with one of the Mexican promotions, so it just makes for, I think, that what will be a better save Pretty much all the ratings are very, very similar. There's a couple that are a bit out there, but like the main event of the pay-per-view Genesis, as you can see there, got an 80 as it did in the previous save and 71 for the show. So no major differences. All my signings came through the same. The pay-per-view buy rates are a little bit more accurate actually now due to another change that's been made. So I'm feeling like this is a better version of the mod to play my game long term. And we are back in the Impact Zone for the third episode of Impact that I'm booking. I hope the fact that I'm starting again doesn't put anybody off the only thing that's different that i noticed was that kurt angle took jay lethal under his wing as a protege which i wasn't going to reload to make that not happen because i'm quite happy that that's happened it's one other thing but that's more to do with the save game around me and i will talk about that after this show because i do want to get now into this episode and impact begins with a series of stills from genesis recapping the events of that show and there is particular focus of course on the main event a really really great match between aj styles and kurt angle they went one-on-one and, one and a Styles Clash saw AJ Styles retain his championship in a 28-minute, really, really setting the standard of what we want to see from our matches here in TNA. So now we kick off with the new cycle of shows, the build to the next pay-per-view, and off the back of Genesis tonight is all about the champions of TNA. There'll be more on that later, but Marrow and Taz confirm that there'll be a champions showcase in the main event with the Motor City Machine Guns facing Amazing Red and AJ Styles. Before that, however, Kurt Angle is going to address the Impact Zone to open the show. The reason Taz and Mara are on screen are just to have some faces on there. It was really just a video package that you'd normally get, so it was rated on Kurt and AJ's Overness, hence it getting a pretty good rating. As we go into that opening segment, as I said, and Kurt Angle comes out and cuts a promo in the ring, he says that he's been thinking over the Genesis main event all week. What could he have done differently? But when he gets here tonight, all he can think to say... Is well done AJ. He was the better man at Genesis and that's all that matters when the world heavyweight title is on the line. As Kurt begins to question where he goes next, he is interrupted when Mr. Anderson comes out and he's in high spirits. He's trying to get some camaraderie going with Kurt, a little bit of banter, but Kurt's really not in the mood. Anderson has misjudged the room a little bit. Kurt's trying to bear his soul here. It's a rare sort of moment of vulnerability from the Olympic gold medalist, but Anderson mentions the pay-per-view in passing. He's just trying to do it in a jovial way, mentions that Kurt lost and Anderson won his first match in TNA, but this causes Kurt to snap. From out of nowhere, he drops Anderson with a headbutt, completely over the top reaction he's out of order and the commentators say that completely uncalled for but angle was clearly in no mood for anderson's antics as he headed up the ramp unfortunately angle not doing well without a script so letting it down a little bit anderson seemingly holding his own but we've continued the storyline between lashley and anderson but now kurt's involved in it whether lashley will come back into it we'll find out but for now, we're transitioning Kurt out of the World Heavyweight title scene and into something with Mr. Anderson. We go into the opening match and the Hooligans making their Impact debut. They came in at Genesis, the mystery team to face the tag team champions, the Motor City Machine Guns. They were defeated on that night, but tonight they pick up their first win in TNA, defeating Lethal Consequences in 9 minutes 56 when Paul London pins Black Machismo with a shooting star press. Creed the weak link, unfortunately getting a 44, but it is in terms of the story, Lethal once again taking the pinfall, so it's looking like he's actually the weak link. He's still playing the Macho Man-esque character a little bit, and it seems like as long as they're still being these fun-loving characters, they are not going to have much success in TNA. London and Kendrick showing great chemistry with each other. It's better than their debut match against the Motor City Machine Guns, actually, and two decent performances from London and Kendrick. Big, big potential for them. As they stand tall in the ring, the commentators are putting over that this is their first win and coming after that debut defeat, which I've already spoke about. 
Speaking of the champions, however, Alex Shelley and Chris Saving come down to the ring. They are impressed with the Hooligans victory in their Impact debut. With their titles over their shoulder, Motor City Machine Guns offer a handshake to Kendrick and London, who were a little bit put out by them coming out and usurping their moment. The two newcomers exchange a glance and they decide it's not for them. You can justify both sides of this. They reject the offer of a handshake, roll out the ring and head to the back. In a way, it's a sign of disrespect from London and Kendrick, but then again, they have every reason, I'd say, to be a little bit annoyed about Motor City Machine Guns coming out when the focus should have been on London and Kendrick. We then get a interview in the back. That segment gave us time for the interviewers to catch up with lethal consequences in the back, and they're talking over their recent struggles. Everybody knows that they've not been in good form, and Creed tries to keep a level head when talking about his defeat to Amazing Red at Genesis, but Machismo cuts him off, he improvised well throughout the segment, and he looks as if he's just had a big epiphany. He removes the macho man shades, shakes his head, puts his hand on his partner's shoulder, dropping the silly macho man accent he's been doing for a while, he says, Creed, Heyman was right. Cutting the interview short, Lethal Consequences then head off. It's not a particularly good segment, and it didn't carry on the storyline, which is unfortunate. I did set them into a storyline with Paul Heyman, just to put over this character change that we have for them ongoing. Clearly, at Heyman's words, whatever he said to them on that first episode, he called them into the office, whatever he said to them, finally getting through to Lethal Consequences. I really do think we're going to get better characters out of these two as we go on, and moving, particularly Jay Lethal, away from Black Machismo is definitely the right decision. Of course, he went on to become a world champion in Ring of Honor and did really, really good things just as himself. Don't think he needs the gimmick at this point in his career. We then get a Champions Roundtable, which is a further part of, as we mentioned earlier, the Knight of Champions type thing. The winners from Genesis's title matches all giving their thoughts in a relaxed environment. They're all on comfortable seats and it's just a long form interview session that we've then cut and put just the key parts on impact. Maybe it'd be a thing that was available in full on YouTube or something like that. But AJ Styles puts over his win. Tara gets emotional when discussing finally regaining the title, while Abyss sits uncomfortably in his chair. When Mike Tanay asks Abyss some questions, he's not in the mood for it, he storms off, he doesn't want to be part of this segment. AJ Styles then joins Red in throwing some light-hearted comments towards Motor City Machine Guns. The idea is that this was recorded early in the week, so it's not like the Machine Guns have gone from the ring to this segment, but we already knew that was going to be the main event, so they're having a little bit of back and forth, promoting that match that we'll see later tonight. It's not really got the star power of the previous main events, but I do think that it's going to be a really, really good match. We also notice that there are two empty chairs in the room, and Mike Tanay says that he has to address it. Awesome Kong and Hamada have refused to turn up for this. We don't know why, no other information is given, but Jimmy Jacobs walks in. He debuts a new age gimmick, which unfortunately gets an initial rating of poor, but he does improvise well as he introduces himself to everybody in the room as the representative of Kong and Hamada. He says that they don't want to come here and answer a bunch of stupid questions. Today begins a new age in TNA and he will stand beside the Knockouts Tag Team Champions. So we're introducing Jimmy Jacobs there as the manager of Awesome Kong and Hamada. They're not really people who you'd expect to be cutting promos and I think that Jimmy Jacobs could be a good tool in extending any storylines that Hamada and Awesome Kong get involved in. But it's also part of something bigger, a long term plan that I have. Jimmy Jacobs is almost the first seed of something that will grow into a very, very big, major storyline. This is very much the start point of something that we will see develop probably over the next year at least is what I'd expect this storyline that we've just begun tonight to last throughout. We're going to not a very good match after that. It's because their perception is both unimportant. I've just realised, I didn't notice that when putting it together, but the crowd were turned off by having a match outside the pre-show with workers they don't have any investment in, and it did cool the crowd a little bit. It's actually a decent performance, well, good performance from Alyssa Flash. Tracy Brooks not doing too well. I don't really have much interest in Tracy Brooks as a serious competitor in the knockouts division. I'm actually expecting her to move on to be somebody's manager pretty soon, but Alyssa Flash picks up a decisive victory in 2 minutes 50, the inverted cloverleaf, and it's all about putting over her as a dominant threat. It's been a little storyline bubbling under between Flash and Brooks if you watch the previous series. Alyssa Flash picking up a win and standing tall. The commentator is putting over her first match of the year and an impressive start to the year, a decisive victory. Maro suggests that Flash is one to watch in the knockouts division. We just need to get her perception up a little bit or maybe just have a face on people who aren't in the unrecognisable category. And we will, I think. She's definitely got the talent to be built up 
higher up in this roster. Eric Young then cuts a promo surrounded by his World Elite stablemates and he is saying that the group are very, very angry, they are vengeful and the TNA roster are going to pay for it. Nobody knows when they're going to strike, but it is coming. A warning from the World Elite there. They've been booked quite badly, not much of a threat in the first few weeks of my booking here. So I just wanted to have a little bit of a promo. It doesn't do much for them, but it at least says that something's going to happen. They're not going to go away quietly. Eric Young not doing well without a script. He's usually very good on the promos, but it's an okay rated segment. As we go then into the third match, but before that, Daniels comes out and cuts a promo. Of course, he's gloating. He is reveling in the fact that he saved Tom Cole's career. Tom Cole, of course, joining him, still has a job in TNA because Daniels defeated Samoa Joe. But there was another factor, of course, suicide getting involved in the match, turning heel and low-blowing Samoa Joe, allowing Daniels to pick up the win. Homicide comes out as Daniels is talking, and he's asking what the hell happened. Homicide is the only person in TNA, or so we thought, who knew Suicide's identity. Daniels now does, we assume Tomko does. Homicide says that Daniels told him that he hadn't spoke to Suicide for weeks, so what's going on with him turning up at Genesis? Before Homicide can get to the ring, however, he is jumped from behind by that man, Suicide, who quickly clears off as Samoa Joe comes out for revenge. Joe is in the next match, so he is quickly out. He checks on Homicide as Suicide escapes down the side of the ramp. Joe's attention then turns to the ring and his match up next with Tomko. And it's a match with good heat and decent wrestling, but Joe picks up a decisive, dominant victory against Tomko in 7 minutes and 14. Tomko is still on the roster as a result of what happened at the pay-per-view, but we don't have much interest in pushing him in ring. There's a plethora of talent who are higher on the priority list than him. He is just the heavy of Daniels who can be used in certain angles, but Joe there with a 75, showing why he is one of the people who we have to build this company around. Getting a 61 out of Tomko is enough praise on its own. During the match, Homicide stands at ringside with Joe. Daniels is at ringside with Tomko. But during the match when Daniels tries to get involved, Homicide gets a steel pipe and chases Daniels to the back. Daniels out of there. So it ends up just being a one-on-one -on -one match and Joe is able to make Tomko tap out with the Kikina clutch. After the match, Joe is not happy. He's not done there. And he takes a microphone holding up Tomko's unconscious body. He demands that Daniels gets out here and that Suicide unmasks shows his face, stops being a coward. On the big screen, we see Daniels stood with Suicide and Daniels says no. They've got nothing to hide, but if Joe wants to know, why don't he speak to that maniac homicide, try and get a straight answer out of him because nobody else seems to be able to. It's more entertaining to him that way. Daniels is just playing a trollish figure. That's almost his gimmick at the minute that he's just winding people up and taking great delight in the mind games that you can play with people and if joe wants to find homicide they've got a pretty good idea where he can find him the camera then pulls out to show homicide out cold in the back he's obviously caught with daniels but suicide has managed to take him out and given that joe is going to get nothing out of homicide tonight joe hits a muscle buster to tom Cole before stomping off up the ramp continuing that storyline there losing heat to it unfortunately it's not a great segment but joe did well and stood out in the segment improvising well Daniel's not doing too well without a script, but we bring the first hour to a close with Joe's hunt for Daniel's and suicide ongoing. And we return for the second hour of the show and Mr. Anderson is interviewed in the back by JB and he is asked about the headbutt from Kurt Angle earlier. Obviously a big incident to kick off the show and we're getting the reaction to that, the cut on the nose and artifacts of what Angle did to Anderson. Anderson is understandably pissed off and says that Angle overstepped the mark. As Anderson speaks, Kurt Angle walks into the shot and he is immediately apologetic. He can tell that he regrets what he did and he says that he doesn't expect Anderson to forget it or to forgive him or anything but he's had a really bad week and he hopes Anderson understands and he's sorry he's a little bit reluctant of course it's swallowing his pride to say that but Anderson is frosty towards Kurt understandably and walks off he stops and then says you know what forget about it Kurt so seemingly the issue between them quashed but we'll see if that sticks as we continue through the weeks we then go into the first match of the second hour the fourth match of the show and it is tara taylor wilde and sarita defeating the beautiful people in seven minutes and 37 von eric taking the pinfall she's easily the weakest of the bunch she's got a 41 here but again still worse than everybody else and tara picks up the win with her widow's peak the new knockouts champion we just wanted to keep her momentum going in a decent match and as you can see, Tara is, I think she's probably the best in-ring performer of all the female members of the roster, taking an uh, overness into account and everything like that. So definitely a good choice for the champion. And as Sarita and Taylor Wilde celebrate with Tara, they then leave, head up the ramp, and Tara takes a microphone there, allowing her to have the floor. She holds the knockouts title and begins to put over what this win means to her. 
when the beautiful people come back out they've just gone to the back the commentators and tara are confused by this and the champion stops her promo to ask what they want she's kind of in the middle of something here as tara goes to continue she's jumped from behind by the returning angelina love in the distraction tara hadn't noticed as angelina jumped the guardrail and she lays out the knockouts champion with the beautiful people jumping for joy delighted to see angelina back while love picks up the knockouts title and raises it in the air now angelina's perfect body gimmick as part of the beautiful people has got a poor rating so the two debuts we've had so far jimmy jacobs and angelina love disappointing with that really and it's not a very good segment i really expected better than that tara improvising well but i do think that a better gimmick rating might have helped that and hopefully it doesn't affect performances and ratings too much but obviously you want new people to come in with a good start and Angelina Love who left TNA only briefly at the end of 2009 it, I'm, I'm thinking about three months might have been more it was a visa issue I think so she was always going to come back and as soon as I could really we brought her back into the fold because I think her as a member of the beautiful people and the dynamic that creates with Lacey in there and Madison Rain and the history they all have, I think, is going to be a really, really good storyline to follow in the knockouts division. And the beautiful people were known ratings getters at this time, so, you know, they're always going to be a big part of this division. We then get a vignette that sort of puts together what we've seen from D'Angelo De Niro so far, the rags to riches story, going back and visiting his old community and giving back to the people who haven't had the success that he has had we also see footage of his in-ring action we're putting across that he is a good guy outside of the ring but of course he has that explosive in-ring style his uh what's it called the elijah express i know it was called in wwe i think it might have been called i can't remember what it was called but i'll know by the time that he's having a match and it just puts over again de niro's character that is the key about him he's a decent in-ring performer but the promos and the gimmick is going to be everything for him and he returns to the impact zone next week so 68 rating we did it on his entertainment i think because obviously that's his strong suit and it did include clips from promo so i didn't just want it to be on his overness because i didn't think that would be a fair representation of what we're trying to get across for him as we go into the locker room and lauren brooke is the roving reporter she wants to get word with aj styles and amazing red who are strategizing ahead of their main event match against the motor city machine guns styles puts over shelly and sabin they're the best tag team in the world but he also wants to put over amazing red who does things in the ring that nobody has ever seen before and that is going to be the x factor in tonight's main event so aj styles carrying the promo and improvising well it's a decent segment and aj styles being the figurehead and the world heavyweight champion he is going to have to help bring other people up to that level there's no reason why saban and shelly can't be on the level of aj styles i think in terms of being the tag team at the very very top of their game so i really think it's going to be a very very good main event like i said maybe not the star quality that we've come to expect from main events but that is part of what we're doing we may have a lower rating than we have in previous weeks but this is a long-term thing it's not about getting ratings boosts week on week on week it's about the fact that in 6 12 18 months we're going to have a roster of talented wrestlers who hopefully are then perceived as stars and major stars and have successfully filled the void of those established names that we've either let go or pushed to the side a little bit. We then get footage from Genesis showing the post-match incident and the aftermath to Desmond Wolf and Jeff Hardy's match which was thrown out due to a double count out. Jeff looked for revenge from the ladder attack from last week's impact and set up his rival on the announcer's table. However, as he went to dive from the ladder to take Wolf out, he was pushed off the ladder by Britney. Jeff Hardy then had to be stretched out of the building and it's confirmed by the commentators that he will not be able to compete for the foreseeable future. Desmond Wolf and Britney's association was also set up during the course of that segment so we're just putting over everything that happened in what was a fairly important segment from Genesis. It's then the fifth match and we're revisiting a rivalry that's been going on for a little while really. Beer Money picking up a victory over the British Invasion. None of the other members of the World Elite are there commentator suggesting that maybe this is part of their big plan they group in to have a big attack all together rather than to try and attack beer money now and maybe fail they have obviously got something in the works it's a very good it's a good match not a very good match i was actually looking at the performances which i'm pretty impressed with rude storm doug williams all doing well british magnus a little bit below that but considering how young and how much less experience he has than the other three he's pulled in his own and both teams having great chemistry so all good things from that match as Bay Money celebrating the ring standing tall. James Storm holds up the Feast or Fired case. We just want to remind fans that they still have that World Tag Team title shot to take at any time of their choosing. And that's got to always be in fans' mind that whenever the Motor City Machine Guns are on screen, could something go down with Bay Money? We then send over to an interview which is directly 
from after the pay-per-view. So it's not tonight, it's from Sunday, but it's only airing now. And it's Bobby Lashley after his match with Mr. Anderson. And he is asked for his immediate reaction. And understandably, the emotions are still raw. He is furious. But his wife takes over as Bobby Lashley seems to be trying to justify what happened, saying that Anderson screwed him and all that. But Crystal, that isn't her priority. She tells him to forget about it. They're leaving this place behind. It's done. It doesn't matter. While Bobby does leave with Crystal, it's clear that the defeat is still playing on his mind. For Crystal, leaving TNA is a little bit more easy than it is for a competitor like Bobby Lashley, who doesn't want his last impression in the company to be that embarrassing defeat. The commentators confirm that there will be a full update on Lashley's status next week on Impact. Crystal Lashley not doing well while Bobby Lashley did. Crystal is... I'm not really sure how much she's going to play into Lashley's character long term but at the minute she's definitely a good part of his storylines to add a little bit of friction and tension because Lashley is sort of all about getting down to business and doing what he does in the ring so Crystal demanding things it does work with the dynamic of husband and wife I think. Back to tonight ODB is then interviewed in the back and she's seemingly surprisingly unconcerned by a defeat to Tara. I mean she's by no means happy but she makes it clear that with the rematch in the bag she's sure that her baby is coming back to her. She's not going to let one defeat over a woman who she has beat time and time again get her down she is only focused on that rematch and as she looks to lay down a date for that potential rematch the beautiful people now four members strong surround her and Angelina laughs off the idea that she can be taking her title back obviously the beautiful people and specifically Angelina Love have their sights set on taking the title from Tara but ODB improvises well and it is a decent segment from ODB and the beautiful people as we go into the main event and that's even better than I expected. I thought we could maybe get a 70. I'm going to have a check at the booking notes actually that I did for this because it seemed to work. The road agent notes steal the show so we did want them to go all out to have the best possible match and while AJ Styles has carried it in terms of in-ring performance I'm really really impressed proving that they can hold their own in that main event position and getting the crowd buzzing. Very happy with that. A match with great heat and good wrestling. Not a bad word to say and very, very encouraging signs. But the finish isn't quite clean. I didn't want the world champion to be losing, obviously. And I didn't want Amazing Red to be losing. But the Motor City Machine Guns are an established tag team. So they should in theory be better as a team than AJ and Amazing Red we don't really get a decisive answer as to which side is better whether the two singles champions are better than the tag team champions because when the referee is distracted by Brittany coming out Desmond Wolf hits AJ Styles who isn't the legal man with a steel chair. Amazing Red then go into his corner but can't tag in his partner. Wolf crouches beside the ring and hides. Nobody's seen him really Alex Shelley and Sabin sort of saw something happen and saw AJ drop but they didn't see Wolf come out and they are able to then, or more have to, take advantage of the fact that Amazing Red is on his own. They hit a made in Detroit and Alex Shelley is able to pin Amazing Red. There's almost a reluctance to them having to do it, but they still wanted the win and they picked up the victory in the main event. Motley City Machine Guns have their arms raised after that victory, but look confused. They sort of missed Wolf's involvement, like I said, but they can't see AJ and the next thing they know... Wolf has come behind them and once again used his chair, taking down Shelley with a swinging chair shot to the back. He then hits Saban in the ribs, another shot to the back, and grabs a microphone saying, screw this champion showcase. He is the only thing they need to showcase because he is the next world heavyweight champion. He says, look around. There are four champions laid out in this ring and only one man standing tall. The show looks set to end there. The commentators are signing off. When with briefcase in hand, James Storm and Robert Roode walk down the ramp with a clear purpose. But before they enter the ring, AJ Styles gets up, he's holding his back, he's bewildered, confused, he doesn't even know that the match is over, and he's wondering what James Storm and Bobby Roode are doing out here. When confronted, Storm and Roode kind of back up, claim they were just coming out to check on the champs, but AJ doesn't buy it. As the show goes off the air, Beer Money back up the ramp, retreating from what we think they were about to do. We don't know, but it looked like they were going to invoke their Feast or Fired match with the Motor City Machine Guns down. But AJ Styles keeps an eye on them and an eye on Desmond Wolf as Impact comes to an end. So it's not a particularly good segment to end the show, but thankfully that main event was really, really good. It's lost heat to the storyline that's now involving Desmond Wolf and AJ Styles, evolved from the one that was Kurt Angle and AJ. I've not started a new storyline, just keeping that old one going, but adding Desmond Wolf and the TNA tag team title storyline has a advanced and gained heat so one loses heat one gains heat and it's a 61 rating so considerably below that main event rating so the rest of the show and, and as I look there wasn't much else good stuff on the show I think we started strongly ended strongly but other than that 
it was a fairly average show, but I'm not going to complain about a show that increased our popularity in 30 regions. Our popularity in the southeast is 60, so it's even above our popularity in our best region. So yeah, happy with that show overall, and particularly happy with that excellent main event. Bit of a screw finish in the end, so not ideal, not necessarily what you'd want, but it does continue a couple of storylines, and I think it was, or I hope it was, an intriguing end to the show. You might know it's on screen now. Gabe Sapolsky and Evolve is my second player in this game. I did sign him in the original save to a TNA contract, but I realised that I didn't really have much for him. Similarly, Evolve weren't in the mod, so I put two and two together. I thought, the pace that this save is moving in, I don't think booking another Evolve show, which will take me maybe 10, 15 minutes, will slow this down. So what I've done is I've set up Evolve as a new promotion in the game. We actually signed everybody from there first show and i've just booked exactly what they did might seem a strange thing to do in a fantasy booking game but i kind of want to book evolve alongside tna of course gabe sapolsky the right hand man of paul Heyman, and i thought it would be nice to over time we'll move away from what they booked maybe even have the agreement that you can do where tna can send development workers to evolve and gabe is now under wwe contract in real life and works with them but what if years before that his old protege Paul Heyman helped him out with the upstart of Evolve and maybe in turn those guys who came through the Evolve roster or were at least featured by him, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly, Davey Richards, a really really strong roster, it's a who's who of people who are stars now but this is a decade before so I think Evolve as part of this TNA future is now type thing. It's good to have a relationship between the companies. And I put on screen now actually the first show as I went through it in game. And that's based almost completely how Evolve one went in real life. If people want me to update what I'm doing each month, I will do. But for now, it's going to be more something in the background. But over time, hopefully it develops into something more interesting. And we'll see where Evolve goes along with TNA, maybe as a development territory in the future. I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do, but I do want to play Evolve and I'm just going to go through the shows that they did in real life and try and book them as accurately as we can. They'll then, of course, be split as times when people aren't available who were available in reality and that's where we'll start to shape and see different things. But for instance, Johnny Gagano on this first show, could he be someone who shows up in TNA down the line? Mercedes Martinez, just a, a really good roster and I think Paul's talks about those young hungry talents, but did he have his finger on the pulse of the independent scene at the time? Gabe Sapolsky certainly did and that is going to help us in terms of this save to get impact exactly where we want and have hopefully first dibs on those talents who I have mentioned.